All right, class, let's continue our chapter 25 discussion. We're going to pick up with biodiversity. A simple definition is biodiversity is the amount of life or the variety of life, I should say, on our planet. If we have more species or more if it, even distribution of species, we're going to have more biodiversity. The single biggest threat we have right now to biodiversity is habitat loss. We're losing coral reefs. We're losing... Um, prairies, we are losing forests, we are losing many native habitats right now. <clears throat> and as we lose those areas for the organisms to live, we are going to lose those organisms and then have a loss of biodiversity. So if we look at coral reefs and rainforests, we're having lots and lots of habitat loss in these very species-rich or high-diversity areas. Alien species, which is a species that's um, introduced to a new biome or a new area that's non-native, um, <clears throat> It's generally going to be considered a species that is both exotic and capable of outcompeting the native species. An exotic species is an introduced species. Most introduced, most exotic species don't do very well. Occasionally, though, an introduced or an exotic species does really, really well, and it outcompetes the natives, and then we call it an alien or invasive species. We also find that pollution from human activities is going to result in acid deposition. As we have more nitric oxide and sulfur dioxide put into the atmosphere, we're going to have more nitric acid and sulfuric acid within our rain. We have climate change, global warming, we're having depletions of the ozone layers, and we're having more synthetic organic compounds, or generally speaking, toxic organic containing molecules that include endocrine disrupting contaminants. And what do I mean by an endocrine disrupting contaminant? I mean artificial hormones that are entering the environment. As we overuse an environment, we are going to um, cause a loss of biodiversity by removing organisms faster than they can be replenished to the environment. This, com this is an, um, comes into play if there's overfishing, overhunting, or overexploitation of a species for the international pet trade. We can also have disease of native species. As human beings encroach on a wild habitat, we bring with us disease uh, microorganisms that convey diseases. Good examples of that include Dutch elm disease, which was brought over to the United States, the emerald ash borer, which is a small insect that causes disease states in emerald trees, and there are multiple other disease states that move from one continent to another continent, multiple other microorganisms, both bacterial, viral, and fungal in nature, that can cause a specific um, species to die off. For example, here is a macaw parrot. Macaw parrots are chronically over harvested for the pet trade but in addition to being over harvested for the pet trade they are also suffering from habitat loss their native forests are being chopped down another threatened to or another cause of th harm to the macaw is that there's the introduction of alien species that means that the macaws have to compete um, more now for those food stuffs those food resources they normally would have less competition for if we look at how fishing impacts biodiversity, generally speaking, as the world's fish catch skyrocketed, we were over harvesting or harvesting faster than we could replenish. And it started to plateau a little bit, but as new fishing techniques were developed, we had another spike in harvest. Now there are many chronically over harvest fisheries in the world, and there's actually a decline in world harvest. <laughs> What do these large trolling nets do during fishing? Well, these large trolling nets are going to destroy the bottom of the aquatic environment, the marine environment. They typically will wipe out the seagrass, wipe out the seabed. Here's a flounder fish. <clears throat> a flounder fish is a commonly harvest fit, harvested fish that will be consumed at the grocery store, at the restaurant. And if you can tell by looking at this fish, it has two eyes on top. It lies flat on the sea floor. And to harvest that flounder fish, you need to drag a net across the bottom of the ocean and disrupt a wide swath or a wide environment of the seabed. We have some direct values associated with the biodiversity, one of which is going to be medicinal value. We, the more species we have, the more chemicals are produced by those species, some of which, some of those chemicals, may actually be beneficial for us as human beings. Classic examples include the rosy periwinkle having an anti-cancer drug derived from it, or if we look at antibiotics, many antibiotics are going to be derived from small microorganisms that grow in a 
rich biodiverse environment. And if we don't have that biodiversity, we'll have fewer options or fewer available avenues to try to find new pharmacological drugs. We also have a lot of agricultural value from biodiversity. We have food and fiber products from agricultural crops. And something else that's worth emphasizing is that if we have this biodiversity within our agriculture, if one particular, let's say, kind of apple is wiped out by a pest, we could potentially have a different kind of apple that's resistant to that pest and that we could still harvest and still have a source of apple. When we have large monocultures or non-biodiverse agricultural practices, it makes it very easy for one pathogen or one pest to completely wipe out the crop. Another agricultural value of biodiversity is that we can have biological pest controls. Earlier in this chapter, we talked about how ladybugs can be used to eat aphids and reduce damage to aphids. We also have wind pollinators as well. These, or excuse me, wild pollinators. These wild pollinators are more than just honeybees, but we also have many moth species and many bird species and species of flies that help to pollinate our agricultural crops so we can have the foods that we enjoy. We also have a consumptive value or a, consume, um, a value associated with consuming these organisms directly. We can catch the fish, we can catch the organisms and eat them directly, or we can chop them down or cut them down and chop them up and use their bodies as a building material. So here are some examples from your text that we can emphasize. We have the periwinkle, which is used for an anti-cancer drug. We can wild catch the fish to eat the fish. We can... <clears throat> wild catch the, the organism and use the organism's body, for example, the armadillo shell, and use that body for producing human goods. We can produce leather, or excuse me, rubber from a latex tree. We can use a ladybug to eat aphids and reduce in herbivory of our crops. And we can rely on wild pollinators, such as a fruit plant, to pollinate our crop species. We also have an indirect value of biodiversity. This indirect value is much more difficult to quantify, but it's a secondary or potentially even tertiary benefit of having lots of different animals or organisms present. We have waste disposal. If we, as we have more biodiversity, we are going to be able to more efficiently break down waste products. And as we, if we look at, for example, retaining ponds or marshlands or wetlands, these wetlands are hotbeds of biodiversity and help to detoxify wastewater before that re-enters the aquifer or re-enters the river system. We also have a provision of freshwater. Our, as we have more biodiversity, we have more freshwater being provided for us. Many ecosystems have a sponge effect. When there's rainfall, if we have lots of biodiversity, that rainwater, that freshwater can be absorbed into the organisms like a sponge and can help alleviate different um, variations within annual rainfall. And then finally, we also have prevention of soil erosion. If we have root material, root plant matter intact in the ground, that plant matter helps to hold the soil steady and prevent loss from wind erosion or water erosion. Our biodiverse um, our microorganisms, particularly within the nitrogen cycle, are going to aid us with regulating our biogeochemical cycles as we take nitrogen from organic to inorganic forms. And we also can help regulate our climate. The more organisms we have on the planet that are going to consume carbon dioxide, the less carbon dioxide will build up in our atmosphere. If we look at forests in particular, they are well known for reducing global carbon dioxide levels. And if you look at um, annual carbon dioxide levels in our planet that are um, tracked on a month-to-month -month basis. When the northern hemisphere is in the summer months, so when we have most of the land mass having its vegetation grow, global carbon dioxide levels drop sharply. And then finally we have ecotourism. Many economies are based on the fact that there's a lot of biodiversity in a local area and that helps to provide a source of living and a source of revenue and income to the local inhabitants. So, guys, gals, concept check right now. Which of the following is not a value of biodiversity? We have medicinal, agricultural, soil retention, water cleaning, or all of the above. Go ahead and pause this video and get me an answer. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, the correct answer is all of the above. Medicinal, we have medicinal, agricultural, soil retention, and water cleaning uses of organisms within the environment. And as we have more biodiversity, all of these processes will be enhanced. 
All right, last section of the book. Last section of the course. This is hopefully on the home stretch. The last 10 minutes of lecture recordings you will watch for human biology. Let's talk about how our we have an unsustainable society right now. If we look at the population growth in the least developed countries, it's a very, very high rate of population growth. This high rate of population growth um, cannot be sustained, particularly if these individuals in the less developed countries adapt a lifestyle or a standard of living that has been assumed within the more developed countries. Consumption in more developed countries is very high. If we look at agricultural practices, they use lots of land and water and fossil fuels for the production of our foodstuffs. This is not a very efficient system. Right now we have less cropland on the planet every single year and that smaller amount of cropland needs to feed an ever increasing human population. If we look at the agricultural feeds in our United States um, and our agricultural products in the United States, most, I should say about half of the plants that we grow in the United States are fed directly to the animals that we eat within the United States. To give you an idea of a rough approximation, if we look at beef or red meat, it takes about 10 pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef. And if you look at pork, chicken, or fish, that ratio is a lot smaller. Particularly with fish, it's about two pounds of feed to produce one pound of fish. So fish is going to have a much lower impact, farmed fish, compared to wild or farmed red meat. <clears throat> Most non-renewable sor sources of energy <clears throat> lead to acid disposition. As we burn the fossil fuels, those fossil fuels are going to put more sulfur and nitrogen compounds into the atmosphere, which lead to sulfuric and nitric acid entering the rain. We're also going to have an increase in smog from the nitric oxide and increase in global warming and climate change from carbon dioxide and methane generation. As we have more and more humans on the planet, as our population grows, we're also going to spread out and take more and more space, encroaching on other species, and those species are going to have habitat loss. We need to invest right now dramatically in building up as opposed to spreading out. And here in the United States, we still have a spread out mentality because we still have lots of open land. But if you look at landlocked cities in more developed countries, right now they're focusing on building up because they can't spread out any farther. So there are many unsustainable activities that we need to cease on our right now. We have deforestation, we have loss of ground soil, we have urban sprawl encroaching on wildlife, we have air and water pollution, we have fertilizer buildup, and we have overfishing, overharvesting of both aquatic and terrestrial resources. But we can do some things to help minimize our human impact. We can recycle. We can preserve our wetlands and preserve our shorelines by building maybe barricades to help maintain the shoreline. We can have multi-use farming with safe farming practices. We can use biological pest control. We can have green rooftops. Um, or we could use mass transit or energy efficient trans, um, forms of transportation. These are all things that are much more sustainable. If we look at rural areas, and rural, particularly in the United States, um, the issues that need to be addressed are the fact that they need to plant more varieties of crops, and they need to have more tree variety as well. There also needs to be more multi-use farming techniques, so um, poly, um, um, crop polygenic crop practices, where we have multiple species planted in the field at the same time, contour pro um, plowing, no-till plowing, or biological pest control. We need to have more restoration of our wetlands. We need to increase the amount of recycling and composting. Within rural areas, it's very difficult to recycle because of the distances from that recycling plant. Um, increases in renewable energy forms such as wind and biofuel are uh, easy ways to utilize rural, the, the amount of space that's present in a rural environment. And then finally, buy local. Think Think global, buy local is the slang. In a rural environment, if you buy local, that local product didn't have to be transported as far and not as much energy was used in getting it to your table. Within an urban environment, some of the design challenges for sustainability include having energy efficient mass transit and transportation. There's lots of people that need to get from point A to point B and there's going to be a high impact if we can have mass transit within these urban areas. If we can find ways to cool and heat buildings using more efficient means, and this is both a rural and urban issue, including green roofs and green belts. Particularly in urban areas though, urban areas, though there's going to be a low albedo or a low amount of 
sunlight reflected back up into the atmosphere, which means there's going to be a lot of excess solar energy absorbed into the buildings, which causes urban areas, generally speaking, to be warmer than their surrounding rural areas. Planting native grasses and butterflies to attract, or native grasses to attract pollinators, um, particularly on the green roofs or the green belts through the urban area, is a innovative practice. And then finally, take business equipment, that old fax machine, the mimograph, the uh, <clears throat> that old overhead projector that was a transparency projector. Recycle that old business equipment. Don't just throw it in the landfill. Now, one caveat is that we can have a very sustainable lifestyle, but most people don't enjoy living a very sustainable lifestyle. You know, truth be told, I would rather drive to my family reunion on the other side of the state of Wisconsin, you know, a couple hundred miles away, as opposed to ride my bicycle to that family reunion. Yes, I know riding my bicycle has a better impact on the planet, but I'm kind of lazy. I don't like riding my bicycle hundreds of miles at a time, particularly when I'm dragging Christmas presents and toddlers and winter weather gear. You know, it's kind of inconvenient. So we need to also balance and to take into account the quality of life. If we look at GNP, G gross national product, as a measure of the mo money flow that doesn't take into account, or as an economic term that doesn't take into account whether activities are environmentally friendly or socially or environmentally harmful or socially harmful. GNP <clears throat> looks at the index um, of just how much money goes in and how much money goes out. So GNP, gross national product, is not a good way of assessing the quality of life. A much better way of assessing the quality of life would be to include some of these non-money-based indicators. So we could look at the index of sustainable welfare or the genuine pro progress indicator. These take into account both the economic and the much harder to quantify environmental and psychological effects that go along with the economy. Human beings, generally speaking, don't like making sacrifices. I'll raise my hand to that. I would rather be comfortable than work harder. Um, so we need to find ways that we can have <clears throat> increased comfort with decreased resource use. Um, it takes a very informed individual and some creativity to find a way to reduce your impact but still maintain your current level of comfort or an acceptable level of comfort. So, guys, gals, concept check. Which of the following is not a sustainable activity? We have contour farming, overfishing, green roofs, recycling, or more than one of the above. Go ahead and pause this video and get me an answer right now. Five, four, three, two, one. The correct answer is overfishing. Overfishing involves removing fish faster from the aquatic environment Fast, removing those fish from the aquatic environment faster than they can be replenished. That is not a sustainable activity. And that's all we have for this lecture recording. If you have any questions about this material, please feel free to post them on my discussion board or shoot me an email or swing by my office when you're on campus. Happy studies!